In today's cold boot, we'll be discussing AMD's new 3D V cache system, Intel's new H series mobile processors, as well as the NVIDIA 3080 Ti launch, or lack thereof. We'll also cover reports of the next generation of Windows arriving on June 24th. Let's hit that power button. It's time to cold boot. Welcome back, it's Poe back again with Let's Get Techie. On the first partition of today's episode, we're going to discuss AMD's new 3D stacking technology, also known as 3D vCache. As discussed in my previous videos on AMD's Computex keynote, Lisa Su announced that they've been working on a chiplet stacking technology. What they're calling the 3D vCache adds an additional 64 megabytes of L3 cache by stacking it on top of a CCD. At the top end of the range, this enables the 5950X to have a total of 192 megabytes of L3 cache. 32 megabytes per CCD as usual, and then an additional 64 per CCD stacked on top of the cores, attached with a copper-to-copper -copper bond using through silicon vias. Also worth noting is they've thinned both the core dies and the new V cache, so the overall Z height does not change, meaning it will work with existing coolers on the AM4 socket. Additionally, in my previous video, I guessed that they would not be using this technology on a Zen 3 refresh, and I've now found out, according to WCCF Tech reporting, I was dead wrong. AMD is planning on using this vCache technology for a refresh of the existing Ryzen 5000 CPUs. We aren't sure yet what they'll be called, although they could revive the XT naming scheme that they used on the Ryzen 3000 refresh. Lisa Su said this tech would go into production at the end of the year, so my guess is an early 2022 launch for this refresh. It does make sense they're going to use this in a Zen 3 refresh, as it's a quick 15% uplift, which is great for a mid-cycle refresh. Also, it should keep them ahead of anything Intel releases, and additionally, keeps them fresh in the news cycle while they ready Zen 4 for launch later in 2022. I'm sure this technology will also come to Zen 4, but it should also include architectural changes worth at least 10%, likely more, as well as a node shrink with an additional 10-20% to 20 in performance uplift or power savings. Usually, AMD takes a bit of both, so let's say 10% performance and 10% power savings. Let us know down in the comments if you're going to attempt to pick up a Ryzen 5000 refresh or if you plan on waiting for Zen 4. On the second partition of today's episode, we're discussing Intel's new H-series mobile chips. Intel may not be able to compete in the performance desktop space right now, but they're actually doing a great job of taking the battle to AMD in the laptop space. These new 11th generation H-series chips take advantage of their new 10 nanometer enhanced SuperFin node. This is the first performance CPU from Intel on the new 10 nanometer node. They've been working to get here for what seems like an eternity, and they finally made it. On its face, at least in the mobile market, it appears to be worth the wait. As you can see in the benchmarks from Hardware Unboxed, this new architecture appears to be very competitive. Although keep in mind, in these slides, they were unable to do a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison due to lack of similar wattage GPUs in the test systems. I think regardless, it's a safe bet to say that you would be fine with the performance of either an Intel or AMD-powered gaming laptop at this point. In gaming performance, it appears Intel is right on par with AMD, if not winning slightly depending on the game. That said, Intel does lose in heavily multi-core production workloads. It appears one strong spot for these chips is power scaling. This means performance scaling is linear with increased power. According to Hardware Unbox, this will see the advantage go to AMD in thinner and lighter laptops, while Intel should claw back to even towards the top end with larger laptops that have beefier cooling solutions that can better handle the increased power. I mentioned earlier that at this point you would probably be happy with either an AMD or Intel powered gaming laptop, but I think your wallet or purse could probably tell the difference as it seems a similar spec Intel machine is going to cost you roughly two to three hundred dollars more. Personally, with Intel machines being more expensive and falling behind in multi-core workloads, I can't really see myself going Intel or recommending Intel right now. It's a shame though because it seems that they finally cracked the 10 nanometer code after several years. On the third partition of today's cold boot, NVIDIA failed to read the room yet again. It's similar to asking your friend in AA who's celebrating one year of sobriety if they want to help you polish off this bottle of tequila you've been saving for a special occasion. A nice option for your friend on the face of it, but probably not something he or she should partake in. 
At this point, just about every review of the new RTX 3080 Ti has shown that its performance is on par with the $1,500 3090. But at $1,200 and the fact that it's only 8% or so faster than a 3080, it's just horrific value. What's worse is that since the 3080 Ti uses the same die as the 3080, NVIDIA is using dies for this newer, more expensive card that could have instead went to powering 3080 cards for a cheaper price. That said, nothing is available for MSRP anyway, so it's kind of a moot point. If you have the unlikely opportunity to buy a 3080 Ti at MSRP, I would suggest against it. I know for some of you who have been trying to snag a GPU for months, that'll be like telling a dehydrated man lost in the desert not to drink from the oasis he's finally stumbled upon. I just hate the thought of rewarding bad behavior. But the other half of the coin is NVIDIA is a publicly traded corporation who has an obligation to its shareholders, and releasing a 3080 Ti while incredibly insensitive to the current plight of gamers is one hell of a power play for their bottom line. The absolute best advice I can give in regard to the new 3080 Ti and all of the other overpriced GPUs for that matter is wait. Just wait. Unless your current card just died or it's struggling to the point that turning down graphic settings or lowering the resolution can't get you by, then you should do those two things and continue playing games on your current setup until hopefully greener pastures emerge. The only situation where I would recommend overpaying for a GPU right now is if you use your graphics card for work and you can increase your output and thus your income from upgrading your current card. If you're making money doing professional work with your video card, it might actually still make sense to upgrade right now even though prices are outrageous. On the last partition of today's episode, we're discussing windows. I need some advice on new windows for the house. Do I go double paned? Maybe the ones that fold in so they're easier to clean? No, not those Windows. Windows 11? Well, actually, probably Windows 10 next generation. Microsoft's announced that on June 24th, we'll get a live stream covering whatever this ends up being. Microsoft's CEO stated, Soon we will share one of the most significant updates to Windows over the past decade to unlock greater economic opportunity for developers and creators. I've been self-hosting it over the past several months, and I'm incredibly excited about the next generation of Windows. There's talk of significant changes to the Windows Store, which doesn't really interest me much because I almost never actually use the Windows Store. Let us know down in the comments if you actually use the Windows Store, and if so, what the heck for. I'm interested in seeing if I'm the only one that doesn't really care for the platform. On top of changes to the store, we're likely to see some significant UI changes. Many moons ago, Microsoft dreamt up something called Windows 10 X, which was for dual screen devices. Unfortunately, X died before they even released it, as we're now being told it will no longer ship. According to reporting from The Verge, Microsoft is taking the best bits from X and bringing them to this next generation of Windows. One change I'm personally expecting to see, and one that has been mentioned for some time now but hasn't yet come to fruition, is axing of the control panel. For those of you in the audience that are at least my age or older, you'll remember back when control panel was how you changed anything and everything. Now we have this odd mix of settings and control panel. Some items are in settings, some in control panel, and some are actually in both. I'm expecting with this new update that everything will finally be moved to settings and we'll have to say goodbye to the beloved control panel. I personally don't know how I feel about losing control panel, but if that's what it takes to get rid of the odd spread of adjustments between two very dissimilar interfaces, then I'm at least willing to see what it's all about before shaking my old man fist at it and telling settings to get off my lawn. Let us know down in the comments if there's anything you're hoping Microsoft will bring to Windows with this newest update. Also, knowing AMD is now refreshing Zen 3, will any of you go for that, or are you just going to wait it out for Zen 4 at this point? While you're down there leaving a comment, please hit that like button if you enjoyed this episode of Cold Boot. Also, if you aren't already subscribed, we'd love for you to join our little community and help us build this into something great. We appreciate you watching, and we will see you in the next one.